In this passionate conclusion, we discover if the ugliest of the Bennett sisters will finally find her place in the world or if repeated disappointments will find her lost and alone for eternity. Or will she learn to make room for love by first loving herself? The book, The Other Bennett Sister by Janice Hadlow. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's get lit. Yeah. Hey, this is Kari. And this is Alexis. And you're listening to Lit Society, a show about books and drama. Alexis, you started off so well, or you started uh, this book off for us so well last week. Mm -hmm. I wanted to jump right in. There's no theme this week. I just want to know how it ends with Mary (laughs) Bennett. But before we get into that, did you have any more information on our author, Janice Hadlow, and her uh, very inspired I don't know, sequel to Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, you know, I came across uh, an article. Actually, I think it was an audio interview um, that was dictated. And the interviewer asked her, what made you decide to write a novel about Mary Bennett? And I just want to share that. She said... I've been reading Jane Austen since I was a teenager and Pride and Prejudice is still my favorite. After about 15 years, I started to notice this rather shadowy figure in the background. The more I thought about Mary Bennett, the more interested I became in her. She isn't a character I think that Jane Austen particularly liked and that intrigued me. I began to think about what life at Longbourn would look like if you were Mary. Jane Austen made it quite clear that Mary didn't really fit into this family. She's very much an outsider in a large family. She has no allies. And we only ever see her through the rather jaundiced perspective Mm. that Austen offers her. I began to wonder what you would get if you put a more sympathetic interpretation on Mary's life. I love that. And I don't think that's any slight to Jane Austen. It's hilarious to have someone to kind of kick around in the story. And in Pride and Prejudice, it's especially hilarious when she get up and play that piano and sing and she can't sing and the whole room gets real awkward. But the way this book put a twist on that scene, it's no longer funny. Are you going to be able to read Pride and Prejudice again and look at Mary the way Jane Austen intended? Or will you forever look at her as she's portrayed in The Other Bennett Sister? Mm, the Other Bennett Sister um, description of her, the character, all of that. I, I will hold that forever. <laughs> OK, I think I will, too. It's going to be hard to have all of this backstory on her now and then still laugh at her. I feel that way about all the characters, really. Yeah, yeah, because she definitely um, added some layers that weren't there before to every character in this book. So in part one of the other Bennett sister from last week, we found Mary um, kicked out of her ancestral home because of the intel. Charlotte moves in with her new husband. And Mary's just kind of hopping from her sister's house to house uh, along with her mother. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then she ends up. Well, her mother's not hopping house to house, but. Yeah, but Mary is her mother stays with Jane. So Mary spends some time with Charlotte and Mr. Collins. That ends up uh, disagreeable. And now she's out in the street again. Running away from being a governess. Where do we find Mary Bennett, the ugly, homely Bennett sister now? Part two. (laughs) Alexis, please take it away. When we last leave off, um, Mary is on her way to London to stay with her mother's brother, her uncle and aunt. When she arrives, she is warmly welcomed at her uncle's home. Um, but everybody, nieces, nephews, they're just so happy to see her. She gets settled into the, her new place at their home. It's um, They got a nice spot reserved for her in the back of the house. It's quieter than the front. She is a country girl. Um, and at breakfast, her uncle has repeated this account that the family lived near the two finest shopping streets in all London better yet, all Europe. And 
Mary noticed immediately that Mrs. Gardner doesn't seem annoyed by her husband retelling this fact, even though she knows this story is old. <laughs> Since Mr. Gardner was speaking of the shopping, Mrs. Gardner decided to take Mary into the city and Mary could see all that Mr. Gardner was speaking about. And she also took Mary to see their shop. It's the Edward Gardner and Son shop, purveyors of fine household linens. It was their domestic empire. And Mrs. Gardner let her know that Mr. Her, she, Mrs. Gardner and Mr. Gardner, they work together, not only for their business, but for their marriage. They're a partnership. So Mary could quickly see that the relationship between her aunt and uncle was warm and loving. There was no favoritism of the children. Eating together with the family was pleasant. There's no teasing, no snubbing. It was Different, very different from the life that she'd grew, grown up in and into the homes that she had just recently visited and stayed with. Mr. Gardner was very different from his sister. He didn't have the airs that her mother put on. So they come back to the house um, and Mrs. Gardner wants to walk arm in arm with Mary. I really appreciate this. This is Mary having some real kind of parental love shown to her. And I really appreciate this part because she's taken uh, taken by surprise by this gesture to walk arm in arm with her. Um, Mrs. Gardner was a discerning woman and she could tell that there is something that took place at Longbourn, but she chose not to pry. And what's, when Mrs. Gardner would hear Mary criticize herself or make self-deprecating comments, Mrs. Gardner would tell Mary she hated to hear her speak that way. And the only condition of her staying at the home was to promise to be more kindly to herself. And if she did that, she could stay as long as she wanted or as long as she could bear it. Mary did her best to try to acclimate into the family. She even offered to help the children by giving them piano lessons. And while Ms. Garner was pleased that she offered, she was like, you don't have to do it. Mary was feeling like she needed to pay for all this kindness that was being bestowed on her. And Mrs. Gardner was like, no, just, you know, live on, enjoy life. I kind of thought like, like um, she was running away from the governess role at Charlotte's house, but she kind of fell into the role as a, a free governess for her cousin. Right. It wasn't yeah, as if yeah. anyone asked her I to do agree. it. She just wanted to spend her days doing something useful for this family that opened their doors and hearts to her. Mm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yep. 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 Uh. Mary had gotten in the habit of walking around London, right? So one afternoon she came back from a walk and it seemed like Mrs. Gardner had something difficult to tell her. She could just tell, Mary could tell. Mary thought it would be bad news. Mrs. Gardner tells Mary that usually around this time of year, spring, we like to be social. We like to entertain, have some parties. And so she wanted to give Mary a heads up because it's going to be more active in the home than she's accustomed to. And Mary immediately suggests to Mrs. Gardner that, look, I can stay upstairs. It's no big deal. I'll be out of the way. I'll keep the children entertained. She hoped Mrs. Gardner didn't feel obligated to include her. And Mrs. Gardner is so insulted. Mary, do you honestly yeah. think we would have a party downstairs with you upstairs? No, girl, we just going to put some makeup on you. I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to clean you up. <laughs> yeah she's like that don't even make sense and it's like I don't usually sparkle at parties she said nobody does especially if they're expected to come this on this is now. when we realized that Mary was raised in a house under um an emotionally abusive thumb and it had real like she uh -huh. suffered lasting lasting yeah. effects yeah mm -hmm. um then Mrs. Gardner tells her you know you was right I do got something to ask you though <laughs> Mrs. Gardner tells Mary that, you know, the style that you're working with, that's great <laughs> for the country, okay? But you in the city now. Wear your you Madewell to... at home, girl. Don't be wearing your Madewell over here. This is London. <laughs> spruce up. Spruce up. Spruce you need some up. new clothes if you're going to be in these streets, girl. You're over here looking like Americana, and I'm talking about the colonies. <laughs> 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 Miss 
Gardner, I'm just going to say, she proceeds to read Mary. I mean, she just <laughs> does. She reads her. She was like, I in can the tell kindest you, way. In the mm-hmm. kindest way, but in a filthy way. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> she said, I can tell you like to be plain, not drawing attention to yourself, but you're doing just that with the attire that you was wearing <laughs> and the best way not to be remarkable is to conform to the standards of the expectations around you okay I Mary love that t- point like yeah. don't say I'm not into fashion so you wearing jeans and a lumpy sweater <laughs> however <laughs> you standing out more than everyone else so what's yeah. it gonna be you wanna stand out or you don't stand out for the right reason that was such a logical thought such a logical thought. And she said, um, Mary tells Mrs. Gardner that she had a bad experience the last time she wore nice clothes and she don't trust herself to behave in proper clothes. What'd she tell her? <laughs> she said, if that was the case, no one would wear nice clothes ever. We all ever. make mistakes sometimes. So every time you do something you, that disappoints yourself, you're not going to wear what you wore at that moment ever again. Girl, come on. <laughs> Like, it don't even make sense. Yeah. I'm telling you. That's why I tell you she read it for filth. Mrs. Gardner <laughs> explained that that reasoning is nonsense. Mrs. Gardner told Mary, I know you've been told a woman's worth is measured only by her beauty, but there is a middle ground between obsession and denial. Mrs. Gardner says, I'm not vain, but girl, I like to dress. OK, <laughs> and I want you to feel the same way. She suggested that they start with um, some day dresses and a couple evening dresses, some silk, a coat, some new glasses, girl, <laughs> some silk stockings, a dye job, new wigs. <laughs> <laughs> Mary's like, but I can't afford it. I can't afford it. She's like, girl, I got the monies. Why you got rich relatives floating in? Come on, I Mary. Know. Get it you together. got rich relatives, have rich relatives. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Gardner's like, please, no, no, I got this. And of course, Mary insists. And she's like, you know what? Let me take you aside for a moment. <laughs> and she take her outside and she like, listen. Lizzie reached out to me and she told me that she wanted to pay for all your clothing expenses. She'd been writing me and checking up on you. And I finally told her, you know, she asked if she could help. And I told her you could help with that. And she tells her that she wanted to do this because of some embarrassing situation that happened years ago. And she's like, Mary is like mad now. She's like, do I dress that bad that the whole family is writing letters about me? <laughs> no, she's like, her heart is touched because Lizzie recognizes that that was an uncomfortable moment for Mary mm-hmm. when the dad lovingly put his arm on, on Mary's shoulder and was like, that's enough, pig. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so just having that validated, it's like, yeah, you hurt me, Lizzie. And Lizzie's like, I know, girl, um, but it's time to stop dressing ugly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But she did ask that question. She wanted to know why the family, why the family, family was writing <laughs> letters about her. And Mrs. Gardner tells her that, you know, some people don't care about their looks at all, but you do. And she could tell that she cared about her looks. She said, you actually dress as if you don't deserve anything better. And you're communicating a low opinion of yourself. If you dress differently, then you will give yourself some self-respect. Um mm-hmm. Mrs. Gardner is like, I can't imagine anything that's so unforgivable that could have happened to you. So please consider taking Lizzie's money and get you a new wardrobe. That's him. Mm-hmm. So as Mary thought about Mrs. Gardner's conversation, she thought about Charlotte Lucas words. She's, and remember, Charlotte Lucas says, it's my situation I dislike, not myself. Mr. Collins' words, happiness depends on ourselves. She realized Mm. that she did lack self-esteem. And when she slid into her first ball dress and she was um, thinking about these things, she realized that having that dress on made her feel like a different person. And she began to ask herself how she got this ideology of miserableness. And of course, (laughs) that came from her mama. Uh, So she would eventually decide to take up Lizzie's contribution to her wardrobe. So the gardener's care and keeping had convinced Mary to look at herself differently and she needed to look at life differently. The gardeners worked hard to be happy and she too needed to work hard to be happy. 
So they go out into the streets and they start looking for dresses, okay? <laughs> um, and then Mrs. Gardner's cousin pops in the store and his name is Mr. Tom Hayward. And Mary had never met anyone like him, um, like Tom. He was interested in fabric sele- selections. He was a skilled barrister and he had a passion for poetry. He was engaging had a jovial personality and he was willing to make some recommendations for Mary as it related to reading. So Alexis, does do they ever talk about his looks? Is he ever described as attractive? Because spoiler throughout the story, it's only one person that seemed to want him. And I found that interesting. Like, is he ugly? Yeah, mm. I didn't realize that, Kari, until I got to the <laughs> end of the book. <laughs> they do not describe him. And maybe that's on purpose to show that it's about more than looks. But she should think something about his looks, I think, when they first meet. Because she's got ideas about other people's looks. But whatever. We'll talk about that, I guess. They're outstanding, I guess. Mm -hmm. Anyway, at the first dinner, Mary cleaned up beautiful. She even sit next to this Mr. Hayward guy. And they have (laughs) the best time. They even made arrangements to do a book exchange. And they talk about what they read after. (laughs) <laughs> she exposed Tom to the history of England, our Catherine Macaulay. And then Tom gave her this lyrical ballads book, um, a poet, a poetry by a, ma- a living poet at the time called Wordsworth. They quickly learned that they favored the same poem. And Tom helped Mary to understand that she should and could read poetry and her other books on reason. Additionally, who told her that in the real world, you have to use wisdom to guide your feelings of impulse and reason. It's impossible to be guided solely by one or the other. Mm -hmm. Tom would later invite Mary and the gardeners to come get up early in the morning and meet them at him at Westminster Bridge so he could read a poem. This well, like- it's cute. He like wrote a letter and he was like, Mr. Gardner, can you please bring Mary at the, um, you know, b- booty crack of dawn <laughs> out to London because I want to read this poem to her while the sun comes up. And Mr. Garner is like, Mary, do you want to do that? <laughs> and Mary's like <laughs> trying to downplay it like, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll do it. It sounds interesting. Mr. Garner is like, I can't believe how generous I am sometimes. OK, Mary, I'll take you. <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> it is. It is really so cute. cute. And Tom's goal <laughs> is to teach Mary that it's, it's OK to feel and that she's not a dull girl. She feels like she's a robot. She can only be intellectual. There's no no part of her that's soft, that's emotional, mm-hmm. you know. And he's like, nah, girl, that ain't you. I see mm-hmm. you. Ooh, mm-hmm. he did. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Now, he like grabbed her arm when she got back in the carriage. He was like, you can be emotional. I see it in you. Ooh. She was like, ooh, <laughs> what was that? And then she was like, are we friends now? Now, my mind would have went right away. This man won't me. Let me just go and get married. <laughs> uh, no, no. Mary, it took Mary a minute to realize she was having some feelings for Tom. And she decided. A long minute, the longest minute ever. But mm-hmm. I'll let you get there. And she decided any feelings that she had, she was going to hold them close until times were expressed more clearly. Mm-hmm. Listen, yeah, one day mm-hmm, while they were shopping in London, who does she come across, Kyrie? Oh, uh, so gross. <laughs> she came across um, Mrs. Bingsley. Yeah, who, Mrs. If you, Bingley. Mm-hmm. Bingley. If you remember from Pride and Prejudice, that is um, Jane's sister-in-law, also Lizzie's ex-rival for love with Mr. Darcy, although he never wanted her. And if you, if you, Come back even a little closer when she was staying with Jane. Um, Mrs. Bingley was there and she was yeah. bullying her. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. A little snide remarks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mrs. Gardner was also familiar with Mrs. Bingley and she didn't say like she was glad to see her. She was like, oh, Mary, I know you know her. I know that you ignored her, too. <laughs> <laughs> And Mary's like, yeah, we're we're not great friends. And Mrs. Garner's like, girl, I'm glad you said that because I don't like her either. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. I like the guidance. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> On another outing with the family, and Tom was with them, we're introduced to Mr. Ryder, who approached excitedly to see Tom. And it turns out he is with Carolyn Bingley. I mean, mm-hmm. imagine that. And she was, of course, acting shady again. Mm-hmm. Then we find out this friend of Tom may be related to Lady Catherine. Y'all remember who that is? Yeah, that's the one that wanted to turn her into turn Mary into a governess while visiting Charlotte's home. Yeah. Anywho, Mr. the patroness Ryder. of Mr. Collins. Yeah. Anywho, Mr. Ryder and Tom come by for tea. And before you know it, Mr. Ryder and Mary are having animated conversations about the heart. He feels strongly um, that one should be led entirely by one's feelings, just as he is. If he feels it, he does it. And Mrs. Gardner quickly changes the subject as she disagrees with his line of thinking. No, she's got a smart little retort. She she does, and I'm gonna let you share that in just a okay. second. If okay. I not if this is not the word, she's like she feels that Mr. Ryder is way too fine to be having those dangerous ideas around young women. <laughs> what were you yeah. thinking? Yeah, she told him, you know, often when people cast aside propriety and just do what they feel, it's the woman who bears who's, yes. who's left to uh, what she say? Birth. Yeah. Quite literally the yeah. responsibility. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, yeah, girl. Anyway. So, Mary, how long are you going to be in town? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mrs. Garner don't like any of this. She don't. She is not here for it. She was like, mm-hmm. Oof. oh, and so after Mr. Ryder leaves, Mrs. Garner tells Mary that um, pay attention to him. OK. Yeah. It's one pay thing for an attention. ugly man to go around being immoral, but a fine man. We can't have it. No. Because somebody will get it. in trouble. Uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> and it can't be my Mary. Mm hmm. She said, Mary's like, he was looking at me. What? He noticed me? Mm-hmm. I don't have looked at people notice. And Mrs. Gardner tells her that if that was the case before, it sure ain't the case now, girl. Mary, you, you got on new clothes. <laughs> That's all it took. <laughs> I know you thought you was ugly, baby, but all you was doing was wearing Maywell. Now that you got on new clothes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Maywell's fine. Oh, but okay. This is basically what Mrs. Gardner is saying. Like, you was never ugly. So, yes, that fine man, he was flirting with you and I don't like it. She's like, you, you, you're. You smile more. You even have this mm-hmm. positive bloom about you. And Mary, Mary, of course, is embarrassed by the compliment. But Mrs. Gardner is like, take that like a champ, girl. Shoot, you cute. You <laughs> are right there. Yeah. And then she warns her to keep her distance from Mr. Ryder because he feels he is beyond the rules that govern the rest of society. Plus, there is a more quality man nearby. Wink, wink. <laughs> So. My cousin, <laughs> who's probably your cousin, but that's okay. No, because it's on this the, is it's on the mama's England. side. No, no. <laughs> it's on the mother's side. So it's not I don't her know cousin. what that means. So, oh. what, what you trying to say? They're Ooh. cousins. No, no, I, uh, I, I, no, I sorry. don't. Agree. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> One day, Tom stopped by to an extent to extend an invitation to the gardeners and Mary to dinner at Mr. Ryder's house, and Mrs. Gardner immediately wanted to know who was there. She was like, who's going to be there? <laughs> I don't know if I want to go. She quickly learned, of course, that Mrs. Bingley would be there and she didn't want to go. But mm-hmm. Mary was like, listen, I'm willing to accept Mr. Ryder's invite and I'm up to the challenge of dealing with Mrs. Bingley. Mrs. Gardner tells her, OK, you know what? But if she step out of line, come get me. OK, oh, that was so cute. She was like, if Mrs. Bingley starts bullying you, I guarantee you she won't be able to bully the both of us. She so said if it's a problem. Stop. You call your cousin. I said, OK, <laughs> Mrs. Gardner, and you fight. Mm-hmm. You know what? I need a cousin like you. <laughs> <laughs> She's her aunt, her aunt. That's oh, not I'm her sorry, cousin. aunt. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I might have an aunt like that. But she ain't wealthy. <laughs> not a Miss Level. Anyway, go ahead. I'm saying Listen, too much. The night of the dinner, Miss <laughs> Bingley um arrives. She show up a little late and then you know, to make an entrance. And then when she arrives, she said, like, Oh, I just love to see the table. <laughs> 
And she be moving the seats around, y'all. You know, they had a 10 She cars. ostracized Mary to the side of the table away from all the cuties. Mm. <laughs> away from all the cuties, right? And she has her sit next to Mrs. Bingley's brother-in-law. And Mary turns that lemons and stuff into lemonade, okay? Mm-hmm. She's like, you ain't gonna have me sitting here looking stupid. Ah, you will not get the better of me. So she decides she's going to have a conversation with Mr. Hurst and she learns all about him. OK, then, Carrie, this party is happening, right? Mm hmm. Then Mrs. Bingley pulls Mary aside and Carrie, how did that conversation go? All I remember is uh, Mary going, you're just insecure because my <laughs> sister took the man you want it. And mm-hmm. so now you're projecting your root trauma onto me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mary's like, I know all about that because I got a new wardrobe and I've ended my therapy sessions and I'm fine. But you, <laughs> your ugliness is on the inside. <laughs> you can't fix it with a new outfit. And that's sad <laughs> for you. This part was funny to me because Mary's mm-hmm. like, she will not be bullied anymore and she will not let this woman um be her. She can't come up. And- She's starting to realize how sad Mrs. Bingley is, how how she bullies from a place of insecurity and Mary's mm-hmm. like, I can I can go toe to toe with you. I don't have to be afraid of you. Yeah. I'm a grown woman who men like now. <laughs> there you go. You know, I got some power over you because that's all you care about. I got some self-esteem. Shoot. Yeah. Then as Mary and Tom are leaving this dinner party, they overhear a conversation between the Bingley sisters and Miss Mr. Hearst. Mr. Hearst now, this is one of the Bingley sisters' husband defended Mary for not looking plain. And he mm-hmm. also said that if I was Mr. Ryder, I'd snap her up before somebody else does. Mm-hmm. And everyone overhears it. Mary's like, I'm my guy, you guys. I'm just fine now, okay? It's fine. <laughs> yes! <laughs> so Mr. Ryder popped up at the Gardner home the next morning to talk to Mary, and she ran into him somewhere else. And he never failed to openly share how he thought of Mary, how highly he thought of her. He always was engaging her whenever he saw her. I think he would just come over there and and read her a poem and be like, I want you to hear this poem. And he was like, you know, Mary, I really think well of you. I mean, I'd be like, is oh, he Mary, propose? Mary, uh, <laughs> quite contrary, you is fine and no longer scary. I wrote that for you, girl. And Mary be like, oh my goodness, he writing uh-huh. poetry. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mary Me? was like, okay. <laughs> so when um so sometime when Tom, Mr. Hayward, first met Mary, they talked about this grand trip to the lakes. And this trip to the lakes is based on a poem within the book that um, Mr. Hayward or Tom shares with Mary. And so they've decided they're going to go on this trip to the lakes and they're going to drop the Gardner children off at Jane's Jane's house, meaning that Mary would have to see her mother. Mm. So let's jump. When Mary finally comes in contact with her mother and as fine as Mary is looking, Mrs. Bennett could barely eke out a compliment to her. So there's some jealousy there, right? Because her mom feels, oh, you looking like a woman that's mar- marriageable. <laughs> mm-hmm. You looking like a worthy woman now that you're staying with my sister. But when I offered you advice, you didn't take it. Mm-hmm. So now I hate you. Mm. It's weird. terrible. Yeah, it's it terrible is. the little comment she makes. She's like, your dress shows off your figure. The color suits you. Good to see you standing up straight and your head not hanging. Shoot, uh, your hair is better than it was, but you know, it could have been some <laughs> curls in there. Terrible. And there's a bloom in you that wasn't there before. So you'll never, however, be a beauty like our Jane. Yeah, you'll never be as good as your sisters. Just a reminder. Isn't that terrible for a mom yeah. to say? Mm-hmm. Mm. Over the days, she would continue to make such remarks um, like women like you can't afford to take chances. Don't be um, putting them spectacles on in front of Mary <laughs> till you're safely married. Mary couldn't wait to leave. She was just putting up <laughs> to be putting up. She wasn't used to that now at the gar- 
because she was living at the gardener's house and it was, you know, just Mm -hmm. peaceful and wonderful. Well, Mary and Tom finally connected after arriving on this lakes trip. They are excited to see each other. They have some real intimate moments. And Mary (laughs) soon admitted to herself, why? I love Mr. Tom. I was Hayward. like, man, Mary, now slow down. You mm-hmm. went from do mm-hmm. I like him to I love him. I love him. Also, I that's your cousin. Him. Come on. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, Mrs. Gardner was excitedly waiting for Tom to propose. Now, the evening, that evening, they talked about taking this um, picturesque hike up a mountain. It's a chance to see something truly remarkable. It's the tallest peak in England, Scoffville. And Mary and Tom were in agreement. They want to see it. M- Mr. Gardner, he kind of interested and Mrs. Gardner is hesitant. They needed a guide. So they talk a little further about whether or not they're going to do it. The next morning, a letter comes for Mr. Hayward. Who is that letter from, Kari? Mr. A letter, Ryder. Mr. Ryder, because yeah. Mr. Ryder has been noticing Mary, noticing him, he think, and he ready to notice each other in person. <laughs> no, listen, <laughs> on this picturesque visit, this he was not invited to this trip. He is crashing the group trip. And do we know who he bringing yet or not yeah, yet? Listen, he's like... I'm here to visit. I brought the Bingleys. Let's have fun (laughs) together. Plus, I missed you. (laughs) I'm here. Let's have fun. (laughs) Nobody is excited at their present. But he don't notice. Yeah, he don't notice. His life is all about joy and being uh, worshipped for his beauty and uh, lack of morals. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Gardner plainly asked Mary if she's bothered by Mr. Ryder's arrival because of the Bingley sisters or Mr. Ryder. Mm. And then she proceeds to tell Mary that it's not uncommon to be not in, to be interested in Mr. Ryder. I mean, because he's fine, okay? Because he <laughs> is fine. But in the attention that he gives her and, and the idea that he's being pursued by another woman, that probably piques your interest, doesn't it? Yeah, it's nice to have someone that someone else want, wants wanting you. <laughs> but that don't mean you should want them, if you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, Mrs. Gardner tells Mary that yeah. that's just because Mr. Ryder expresses him. Just because Mr. Ryder expresses himself the loudest doesn't mean his expressions are the most profound. Oh, wow. And she may have to um, wait a little longer for time to act, but because he's a patient man and mm-hmm. slow to thought. He takes some time. Next thing you know, Mr. Ryder and his crew, they done invited themselves on this special trip up to the Mountain View. You like, <laughs> and Mr. Ryder tells Mary, listen, I want to be there right when you get that view so I could be holding your hand and whatnot. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mary was hoping for some time alone with Tom. Her cousin. So, <laughs> Before the hike, <laughs> Mr. Ryder takes time aside to discuss legal matters regarding his family. And then Mary observes the conversation from a distance. She feels something is not right. And the next day, Tom sees different, seems different. OK, it's like he has a sadness about him. She like, what's going on with my man? Yeah. Mary began to notice that Tom was distancing himself from her. She was very concerned. So Mary decided to charge him up about it. Um, the way he had been treating her, she um, she decided she would talk to him on the hike up the hill. The day of the hike, Tom was still acting funky, but there were <laughs> moments of intimacy. And Mary realized that Tom was jealous. Mm-hmm. And she was like, OK, he's jealous. But then wait a minute. She then got a little angry because. Yeah. Why wouldn't he just say his feelings or ask her a question about her feelings? Yeah, agreed. Instead of distancing himself from her. And when the guy saw that rain was coming, okay, so they're on this mountain hike, they're going up and whatnot, and they see it, they get to one point where they get the nice little view, but there's even more to see if they just keep pushing forward. And so this guide is like, 
Listen, y'all, rain is coming and we should go back. Because mm-hmm. if we don't, it's going to get a little dangerous. And so he suggests they turn around. But everybody else wants to keep going except Tom. He's being reasonable. He's like, listen, we paid this man to guide us. Why wouldn't we follow his directions? <laughs> Come yeah. on, y'all. Let's go. And Mary, instead of supporting Tom, she's like, I want to see. I'm going to push forward with everybody else. Mostly Mr. Ryder is like, you guys, we must live, live in the moment, do what you feel. Yeah, a storm is coming. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> and the guide is like, no, shut up. How'd you, this ticket says four people. How will we get six? <laughs> yeah. And Tom is shocked that she sided with him. And Mary says she is tired of thinking, I just want to feel. I'm mm-hmm. tired of this reasoning crap. <laughs> so, Once they arrive at this desired point on the mountain, the downpour of rain comes, just as the guy predicted. And everyone is soaked and the conditions of going back is dangerous. But guess what? Mr. Ryder is like, look, there's still more to go. We should upward and onward. Mm -hmm. And Mary's like, I feel like I've made a grave mistake. Mm hmm. So they head back up down the mountain. And at one point, Mary slips and Tom makes sure to assist Mary on the way back down the hill. The next morning, I want to call it a Dear Jane letter, but it's not really that. Mm -mm. Tom wrote Mary a letter telling her that he had to leave on business and that. So what's messed up is he didn't write the letter to her. He wrote the letter to the lovely gardeners for their hospitality. And he said, please pass on my sincerest regrets to everybody else. Remember, oh, he didn't he even know. mention her name. <laughs> no, he wrote it, it to was cold blooded. Cold blooded. I, so, <laughs> I think he wrote the letter to her because she received it. <laughs> He wow. said, sorry, gardeners, thank you for your lovely hospitality. Please pass on the regrets to the rest of the party. <laughs> So Mary to do that. Okay, okay. He was like, see you later, but remember me though. That's what he said to Mary. Okay, listen, Mary yeah. is hot and she hurt, but she eagerly waited for time to return. So they go back to town and she like, ooh, I wish time would come back. I miss him. <laughs> come on, Tom, come back. Meanwhile, Mr. Ryder is making regular visits, okay? Professing strong feelings, okay? And you would think um, that Mary could write Tom a letter, but that wasn't considered proper. Because she's a woman. She can't Mm -hmm. be reaching out to him. Mary had to wait for Tom to reach out. And finally, a letter does come. And it's from her mama. Boo! Mm. Yeah, boo. (laughs) And her mother was just as mean and bitter as usual Mm -hmm. toward Mary with her disparaging and uncomplimentary comments. One day, Mr. Ryder stopped by and immediately... Mrs. Bennett notices that he's interested in Mary and she and that insisted fine. Mm-hmm, that Mary make herself available to him because she ain't had no other options. And Mr. <laughs> um, Ryder starts making these regular visits until he eventually proposes. Something. Kyrie, what kind of <laughs> proposal did he make? So they get alone together after the mama been letting him in the house. So the mother and Mary right. have been arguing because Mary's like, I don't like him. OK. And the mother's like, oh, you stupid. And she like says that a lot. Like, oh, mm-hmm. you just the dumbest person I ever seen in my life. I don't care what you like. You're going to marry him. He's fine and wealthy. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, with, you know, stop shaming me, basically, Mary, mm-hmm. and just get married, you weirdo. And so uh, she keep letting him in the house. And one day he shows up alone. It's just them in the great sitting room, whatever. And uh, he's like, come away with me. I have to admit I love you. And let's go uh, make a great life together. And she's like, oh, my goodness, he's proposing to marry me. Look, <laughs> that wouldn't be fair to you because I don't love you as much as you love you. So let's um just be friends. OK, I don't want to lose our friendship as she's pushing them out the door. Mm-hmm. And Bye. he is shocked because mm-hmm. he is fine. And ain't nobody ever said no to him for nothing. That That's this word on the street. Mm-hmm. Well, so later, Mary was like, wait a minute. <laughs> he didn't mention marriage once. <laughs> Is he I 
I should have been angry. This man just proposed that I go live with him. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. That's Mary was like, wait a minute. Well, yeah. yes. The next day he came with a proper proposal. And this time her mom's there and told Mary um, and Mary told him like she loved him as a friend, but not like uh, romantic and stuff. And she only <laughs> hardly like him as a friend. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mr. Ryder because, told Mary yeah. that he wanted he felt that she would improve him and encourage her to truly consider his proposal. Mm. Mrs. Bennett, of course, is irate because Mary didn't immediately say yes. And Mrs. Gardner spoke privately with Mary saying, Mr. Ryder should be considered honestly. Mm -hmm. And Mary is like, what? Even you? (laughs) Mrs. Gardner had reached out to Tom's mother and his mom had replied that, yeah, he has gone walking. He's just, you know, he out. (laughs) Like, But when he finished walking, he going to return to London. But nobody knew when he would return to London. He is just (laughs) out there walking like forever. Mary had to consider her situation. She would end up writing the letter to Mr. Ryder to decline his offer, his proposal of marriage. Now, a couple of days later, Carolyn Bingley walks up asking to have a private conversation with um, with Mary mm-hmm. and Mrs. Bingley asked whether Mr. Ryder had proposed to Mary. Mary is like, that's none ya, okay? <laughs> none ya business. And Mrs. Bingley like, well, I already asked him and he said he proposed. And Mary said, then why are you in my face if you already talked to him? Mm-hmm. And what does any of this have to do with you? Mm-hmm. She proceeds to tell her that Mr. Ryder came into some additional money. So if you holding out to get married to him like your stankin' sister, (laughs) 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 then you go ahead, but you really need to get out of my way. (laughs) And Mary is like, woman, I don't want to marry that man. And I'm sick of Mm -hmm. you and your bitter, angry spirit. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. The only man I want to marry... And is the only one for me is Mr. Tom Hayward. And you could do with that information what you will. Yeah. So they have a little showdown in a tea shop and Mary stands up for herself in a very respectable way. Um, Bingley is still trying to get under her skin and she just won't let her. She refuses. Well, although she to. is furious, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. she is mastered kind of hiding her emotions, her feelings yeah. a little bit about that. So. After this happened, she don't know where Mr. Hayward is. So she's essentially mourning the loss of a relationship. She's preparing her life to be an old maid. And in the process, she comes across (laughs) a graduating John Sparrow and his happiness and joy of completion. This gives Mary peace to see John Sparrow happy. This is the eye doctor's son that she kind of insulted at the party at the urgings of Charlotte and her mother. Um, And she's always wondered, like, what happened to him? And she sees him in the street. He's just graduated from school. He's being celebrated by his peers. His life is full of promise. He's like the king among them, among his friends. And she's like, he's fine. He he went on to be fine. And you know what? I'll be fine, too. Mm -hmm. A few days later. Mr. Hayward shows up and the house, he shows up at the house and Mary decides that before she it's can been talk two to months, him. Y'all, I thought it was years. <laughs> when you reading this book, you feel like she ain't seen him for years and he show up and she's like, it's been two months. Where have you been? <laughs> like, girl, listen, Mary decides she going to do all the talking. Okay. And she professes her love for him for Tom Hayward and Tom is like marry me Mary (laughs) (laughs) and Mary has truly found her happiness I have come to explain Mary if you will allow me to do so and to ask for your forgiveness I know I do not deserve it but I hope you will grant it anyway when he spoke her name 
She thought she must capitulate, give in to the desire rising up in her to let him talk and explain as much as he wished, but she made herself resist such a surrender. There were things she was resolved to say and she would not be prevented from doing so, even by her own unruly feelings. I know it is not usual, she said, surprised at the steadiness of her tone, for a woman to put herself forward in this way, but I hope on this occasion you will allow me to speak first. I have had a great deal of time to think about what I would say if this moment were to come to pass. And now that it has, I want very much to make no mistakes. Shall we sit down? She moved to the sofa and arranged herself there, back straight, head held high. He took his place opposite her in the chair he had so often occupied in that room and looked at her, serious, expectant. I hope you will excuse me if I begin with a personal observation. Mary knew her words were stiff and formal, but she had chosen them carefully. She was determined not to lose her composure, and the chilly exactness of her words helped her preserve it. For as long as I can remember, I have tried to use my intellect to understand the world. I have been teased and laughed at for it, and it is not thought a very attractive quality in a woman. But when I was lonely and unhappy as I was for much of my life, it served me well enough. She shifted in her seat. She was nervous, but she had begun and knew now she could continue. Then I met you and everything changed. You introduced me to poetry. You showed me the beauty of the natural world. You made me laugh. You gave me warmth and kindness and affection. In short, you taught me to feel as I had never done before. He sat absolutely still, making no further attempt to speak. And I did feel, Mr. Hayworth. I experienced every kind of emotion in your company. It began as friendship, but soon I began to think I allowed myself to hope that you felt that you intended something more. She cast her eyes down. She wanted to continue, but was not sure she could look at him as she did so. That made me very happy. In fact, I don't think I've ever been happier. But then, up in the lakes, everything went wrong. I felt I had lost your affection, but I didn't know why. The sensible thing, the rational thing, would have been to ask how I had offended you and not to have given up until I had discovered the cause of your change of heart, but my emotions got the better of me. I was angry, confused, unhappy, and in the end, I said nothing. And neither did you. Down in the hall, Mr. Gardner, prized guilt clock began to strike the half hour. Its chime was very caring, and Mary paused until it was done. I cannot say what kept you silent. I only know I quickly began to regret my own stupid failure to speak. But by then you had gone away and I could do nothing to put right my mistake. I was told that as a woman, it was not my place to act. All I could do was wait. That is what I've been doing until this very afternoon. Mary looked up and their eyes met. But I think I have done enough waiting now. She leaned forward and the words began to spill out of her. For I must tell you, sir, that some weeks ago I made a promise to myself that if we ever saw one another again, I would hold back no longer, but would speak, would act, no matter what the world thought of it. If you lacked the courage to declare yourself candidly, I did not. I swore I would confess my feelings to you regardless of the consequences. I would rather tell the truth and risk humiliation than pass up the chance of happiness because I was not brave enough to say honestly what I felt. Now that she had come to the point, Mary's spirits almost failed her. She could not stay where she was, but rose and stood behind the sofa grasping its chin's back tightly with both hands, willing herself to break every rule of propriety, modesty, and good behavior and continue. So this is what I wish to say. I love you, Mr. Hayward. I have loved you for a very long time and know I will never love anyone as much as I love you. You are the only man who could ever make me happy and I have missed you. Oh, I have missed you so very, very much. Then her self-possession finally deserted her. Her voice broke and a sob escaped her. 
And before she knew it, he was beside her, had taken her in his arms and was holding her tight against him. Mary, my own dearest Mary, everything you say, it is exactly what I feel. I love you, Mary, so deeply. I am so very sorry if I hurt you. I shall never do it again. All I want is to love you as you deserve for the rest of your life, if you will allow it. And that brings us to the end of the story. <laughs> let's take a quick break. All right, let's do it. Do, 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 do. And we're back. Kari, what are your final thoughts and would you recommend this book? Yeah, when I picked up this book, I was not in the mood to read a story of this nature. Um, however, I was so captivated by the characters immediately. Um, I felt the tone of the book and the flow was so similar to Jane Austen that I could have believed Jane wrote it. Um, mm. And I think that is uh, w worth celebrating Um I think the author did a great job. Extremely well done, Janice. And I would recommend this book to others because it is just a delight. It is a pure delight. I couldn't wait to. In fact, I couldn't break it up into two. I had to finish it um, in a few settings as soon as possible because I was just so captivated by Mary's story. I wanted to know how it ended for her. Um, and I'm ashamed to have laughed at her in Pride and Prejudice. She deserves respect. And love. And once she started respecting herself, thanks to the hand of a loving aunt, um, then, you know, love came her way in life. And I love that message. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I recommend it. I would read it again. What about you, Alexis? You know, um, I love the path that she took of not reintroducing John Sparrow into Mary's life throughout the second half of the book I like okay John Sparrow is coming John Absolute, Sparrow's coming what are you talking about through the end of the book I'm like now how is these other lovers gonna exactly. work because I know she getting back with John Sparrow exactly exactly there's only one man for you that's the Jane Austen formula there's <laughs> once you find your real love you must spend your life searching for a way to marry Ooh, him uh -huh. so I like yeah I agree with you yeah that. she liked him when she was younger time passes mm -hmm. life goes on yeah, it was amazing. I, I was just waiting for him to pop up. Um, <laughs> and I appreciated Mary's growth throughout the story. It was like really special how she stood up for herself for, in front of her mother, in front of Caroline Bingley, even with Tom. She was like, I will voice my opinion. I will tell you. I won't wait for you to say how you feel because I know my feelings and I can confidently share them. Um, mm -hmm. it's entertaining throughout and it also gives you something to think about sharing your feelings open and honestly following societal norms um, and her mother's treatment of her and then I, I um, really see like middle child issues in here like really mm -hmm. I do um, and I would definitely recommend the book I enjoyed it immensely Lovely, lovely. So, Alexis, what are we reading next week? Good Girl, Bad Blood, the sequel to A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Ooh. Jackson. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, thank you. See you next week, everyone. So, uh, thank you for listening to Lit Society. We'll see you next Thursday with that riveting book. Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Anaria and Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five-star review for our show on Apple Podcasts, along with a comment about why you absolutely love us. We, we love, love you too. too. Please also leave a five-star review for us on Spotify if that's where you're listening. If you've enjoyed what you've just heard, tell a friend about Lit Society. Visit LitSocietyPod.com for show notes, this month's book list, and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter. And until next time, you guys, read, read something. something.